Um, good afternoon, um, and welcome to the Control Society Speaker Series, in, in, in fact, the first installment of it for this year. Um, I'm Ezekiel Dixon-Roman from the School of Social Policy and Practice, and I co-curate this speaker series with my colleague Jessa Lingle of the Annenberg School for Communication. Control Society is supported by the Provost Excellence Through Diversity Fund, um, the School of Social Policy and Practice, Annenberg School for Communication, the Price Lab for Digital Humanities, um, and this year, we are also fortunate to have additional co-sponsors, such as the Department of Cinema and Media Studies, Department of Africana Studies, Department of History and Sociology of Science, program for, Penn Program for Race, Science, and Society, and the Center, the new Center for Digital Culture and Society. Um, this year, uh, Justin and I decided um, that we wanted to curate a series that was featuring um, uh, scholars of color that are doing cutting edge work on data, technology, AI, and questions of blackness and brownness. Um, this year we are excited to feature um, uh, speakers, uh, uh, scholars such as Meredith Broussard um, in co-sponsorship co with the Center for Digital Cultures and Society, Ruha Benjamin in co-sponsorship with the Department of History and Sociology. So, you know, I'll leave the co-sponsorship job for now. Um, uh, Kara Keeling, uh, Stephanie Dinkins, Des Denise Ferreira da Silva, and Jasbir Puar. Um, and today we have the privilege and, and uh, an excitement to be able to host um, V. Mitch McEwen from Princeton School of Architecture. Um, and in the spirit of time, I you know, I, so those of you that have been coming to Control Societies in the past know that the first one, I usually will give some context to even what Control Societies is, just in, for those of you that may not be familiar. Um, but I'll just say very briefly, the very concept itself is inspired by a little short but powerful essay by the French philosopher Gilles Luce that was published almost 30 years ago. Actually, the French publication was in 1990, um, and that essay is called Postscripts on Societies of Control. Um, and I'll skip, skip the rest and move on to directly to introducing our speaker. So V. Mitch McEwen joined the faculty in fall 2017 from the University of Michigan's Talman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, um, where she had been an assistant professor since 2014. She is the co-founder of an office, or A or N office, an architecture collaborative of studios in Detroit, Los Angeles, and Brooklyn. McEwen's design work has been awarded grants from the Graham Foundation, the Knight Foundation, and New York State Council on the Arts. An office, uh, pro an office pro projects um, have been commissioned by the U.S. Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennial, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, and the Istanbul Design Biennial. Her projects in Detroit have produced a series of operations on houses previously owned by the Detroit Land Bank Authority. These include a combined residence and flower incubator for an engineer at 3M, a strategy for 100 houses selected by the city of Detroit to de densify the neighborhood of Fitzgerald, and an award-winning repurposing of a balloon frame house titled House Opera. Her work in urban design and architecture began at um, Bernard uh, Shumi Architects and the New York City Department of City Planning, as well as founding the Brooklyn-based nonprofit Superfront. Her talk with us today is titled Experimental Life. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to Mitch. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, so how, how much time, time do we have now? Okay, okay, great. Um, all right, so I'm calling this Experimental Life, and, and really um, the talk I'm giving is building off of a chapter that I have in a book that's coming out in a couple months from MIT Press called Bauhaus Futures, which is kind of thinking about the 100 years of, of the Bauhaus. And, and what I'm going to do with this talk is kind of use that as a way to open up some of the, the questions that I put on the table in that chapter, but, but interrogate more of my own work in relationship to um, my ideas that I'm laying out about the Bauhaus. And, and so the title of that, um, well, before I get to the robots, the title of that is Negro Bauhaus, Design and Politics of Experimental Life. Um, and so I'll just kind of, I'll just kind of give you the setup before I jump into my own work and then, and then go back to, to this kind of argument. And I usually wouldn't be talking that much about a book, except I think that 
because I don't really do books. But I think what's nice about this one is so much of it is about Annie Albers. And so, so for those of you who are actually kind of engaged with the history of design, um, Annie Albers was one of those figures that, as a woman in the Bauhaus, was, was very much kind of um, marginalized you know, compared to Gropius and these others. But So if it was like a heavy Gropius book, I wouldn't even be showing it to you. But considering how much of it is Annie Albers, it is, it is kind of a wonderful collection of texts. Um, but so to jump into kind of my argument there about experimental life. Um, Starting with a quote from W.B. Du Bois, The Study of the Negro Problems, European scholars envy our opportunities, and it must be said to our credit that great interest in the observation of social phenomena has been aroused in the last decade. He's talking in the turn of the 20th century. An interest of which much is ephemeral and superficial, but which opens the way for broad scholarship and scientific effort. So a century ago in the United States, the most experimental framework for understanding everyday life as a problem was not a discipline like art or design, but a subject, the Negro. While the Bauhaus in Western Europe invented design of everyday life as a problem, the United States invented the Negro as a problem. The key to unpacking any transformation in the 20th century may be to assess what gets schematized as a problem. And you, you are the experts on this, not me, so this is just an idea. Whatever is schematized as a problem becomes eventually open to the operations of scientific practice, the social scientific, material invention, new reporting devices, and of course computation. The Bauhaus may be considered a school and movement instead of practices for schematizing everyday life as a problem. This reading of the Bauhaus could chart a line to the Eameses and other American modernisms of the mid-20th century, as well as a projective sense of how technology may reshape everyday life in this century. However, there is something a bit perverse in deploying the Bauhaus as a model to schematize contemporary priorities and projections, to the extent that the Bauhaus acted as a counter to the imperial ambitions of the Beaux-Arts as a move toward verifiable claims in the studio rather than historical reference. Reifying the Bauhaus as a historical construct to exalt and guide us into the future would be at the paradigm level to destroy it. One of, the paradigmatic, one, of the, one of the paradigmatic shifts in staging design studio as experimental is to erase the assumed continuity between an archive of historical traditions and projective design techniques of the present. So with that, before I get into the Negro, let me kind of jump into some of these kind of techniques of the present and how I'm, how I'm working with them. Um, so uh, there's a research group at Princeton that I direct called Black Box, and, and the title is really a riff off of a, a Rainer Banham quote about the secret profession of architecture being the black box as well as a riff, of, of course, of blackness and a riff off of the idea of the black box as a kind of, um, uh, 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 it, even before the idea of computation, a kind of idea of the unknown. Um, and so there, the, the goal of black box research, um, the research group, is, is to work in, in nonlinear ways in relationship to architecture and, of course, to engage robotics. Um, it's staged at the Embodied Computation Lab at, at Princeton. And the way that I think about robotics in architecture is that, um, the 20th century, because robotics um, you know, emerged in relationship to manufacturing at a time then that architecture had already kind of experienced with uh, prefabrication and manufacturing in the 60s, um, architecture and, and robotics didn't really intersect each other in the 20th century. And in, 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 in this century, we have an opportunity then for, for a very different idea than a manufacturing idea of what architecture might do with robotics. Um, and so effectively, um, part of the, the goal then to perform new modes of architecture is also to perform new modes of, of computation and new ways of, of thinking with the tools of the present. Um, and so some sort of related terms that, that just sort of come up here, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can just kind of see from, I, I'm going to talk to some of these specifically in terms of, um, you know, thinking about MIT Media Lab as a precedent before I go back to um, this, this sort of way of approaching the Bauhaus and Annie Albers specifically. Um, but there's a way where a combinatorics and chance and intuition um, can stage relationships to computation as well as relationship to, to art practices, performance art practices like, like Fluxus. And so um, part of then what's, at, what's sort of at stake in, in computation today is, is how one considers maybe forms um, forms not of objects, but, but forms, uh, not even of data, but forms of stochastics maybe, uh, forms of, of patterns. One of the things that, that interests me um, in terms of um, randomness and stochastics and chance is the way that something like um, uh, cyclical returns in an economy in terms of looking at GDP and markets can look so similar to something like hurricanes, right? So there's a way in, in which um, working, rather than working with objects, um, working with 
the 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 material reality um, and also the the capacity to compute um, really sort of what is unknown before it happens is what's at stake in the black box. Um, and so, as I mentioned, this is uh, staged within the Embodied Computation Lab at Princeton, which is a facility that was built in the past few years specifically around um, a set of robots and and um, these kind of two large scale manufacturing robots then determine even the, the span of the, of the structure that they're housed in. Um, and, and so it's really sort of a way of, of having a, a, a shed, really, um, a way of, of working iteratively um, with, with these tools and with the various materials. So I'm going to show you in this talk. Um, I'm going to jump back and forth between um, these ideas of design over the past 100 years um, and sort of how experimental life, how I'm framing experimental life in that, um, but then also show you some of the projects, uh, recent projects um, from the past um, year or two, and even some, some projects that are, that are in process that we're doing at the, at the research group, and, and also kind of make a connection to some of the work uh, that I do at the urban design scale in terms of infrastructure, um, because you know I, when I'm when I'm showing something like the markets or the hurricane, um, part of what what my work has been interested in uh, really since I set up an office in Detroit about five years ago was how also uh, governance of 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 um, really how how urban planning you know similarly to robotics how how we can think urban planning in situations of really unknowable sort of realities on the ground, right? Rather than the kind of linear urban planning approach. Um, and, and I'll show you what I mean by that in terms of some examples in Detroit. Um, but so to, to begin with, with some of the, the teaching that I was doing, um, part of the way that um, the, in the intro you heard about the Detroit Land Bank Authority, um, there's, I'll show you a couple projects around the Detroit Land Bank Authority and this, this set of tens of thousands of houses that are owned by the public. Um, and I want to put that into conversation with something like a hurricane, something like markets, um, because there's a way in which, you know, for a, a municipal agency of a dozen people or even 30 people to address 50,000 or 60,000 vacant houses is similar to addressing a hurricane. Um, there, there's no way of sort of producing a granular sort of understanding of each house as an object within the time span that it's necessary to engage. Um, so one of the ways that I addressed that in terms of my teaching was to teach students to design in a housing studio rather than design one house at a time to design 100 houses at a, at a time. And of course, we did that um, using um, algorithmic processes, uh, using parametric tools. But rather than using these parametric tools to refine um, one sort of exquisite object. The goal was to produce um, a set of potential realities um, in terms of uh, sort of prehending um, what, what might be at stake for, for these uh, vacant houses that are, that are already publicly owned, right? Because the Detroit Land Bank Authority is, is a kind of quasi-public entity that the city set up um, to, to basically um, create a collective management of these tens of thousands of, of vacant houses. And so in the students, actually, they didn't really design 100 houses at a time. They designed, well, they were tasked with designing 99 houses at a time. Um, there was a bit of a Jay-Z reference with the kind of 99 problems. Um, but most of them only designed a couple dozen. Um, it's actually, it, it, took, it takes a lot of ambition to, to I think, you know, each of those powers of 10 um, takes another kind of scale of ambition. But, but the techniques were there, the techniques were there. Um, and, and so getting back to Du Bois, um, there's, you know, if, if you want to unpack this talk afterwards, there's a conference that we staged um, at the Embodied Computation Lab last spring called Black Imagination Matters BIM Incubator. If you go to bim.princeton.edu, there's, there's a whole set of speakers that are kind of part of this conversation. But I, I want to I then kind of situate this again um, within thinking of that, that sort of long um, trajectory. Because I think in a way this does relate to, to modernism, at least in architecture. So to turn back to Annie Albers. Um, so let us turn again to Annie Albers, this time for another way of thinking what design does. All right, so this is again in the Bauhaus 100 years ago. If then it appears that our stamp is or should be an immediate or implicit lucidity, a considered position, a reduction to the comprehensible by reason or intuition, in whatever we touch, confusion always gets a negative rating. It's a parenthetical. We have established a basis for designing, designing in any field, from city planning to the planning of a house or a road, from the composing of music to the formulation of a law, the weaving of a fabric, or the painting of a picture. Behind the endless list of things shaped is a work of clarification, 
of controlled formulation. And of course, the, the weaving is, is, is sort of where, where she gets in there. Um, so before I get to sort of the race as a kind of secret US power technology, um, so design here is not defined by application of use, right, in the Annie Albers Bauhaus construct. Design here is not defined by application of use, certainly not by scale of object, right? So it's not like you could have industrial design and then UX design and then architecture design, right? It's a different way of conceiving of design. Instead, design in this rubric of the Bauhaus appears as a considered position. And the work that it does is the work of clarification or controlled formulation. This clarification happens in the midst of formulation of becoming in relation to a position that is considered. This is the kernel of what appears in the Bauhaus paradoxically as standardization, Right, because sometimes in the Bauhaus, what you're looking at, I, I mean, I don't know, you're not the design school, you're communication, but I presume that the Bauhaus is such a big name that it registers as a kind of communication. Um, paradoxically, a standardization, material exploration, performance practice, and social experiment all at once. As historian Lucia Ales quips, daily life at the Bauhaus was anything but ordinary. Everything was an experiment. So part of what I'm interested in, in is the way that experimentation is not just a kind of formal process, not something that can happen in the studio with a kind of genius that's composing something, but, but actually experimentation can happen across technology and across life. Um, and so there, this is where um, I do think there's a way um, to, to engage with the kind of intense violence and cruelty of this country um, as a mode of design not to say then that one considers um, the, the sort of violent acts as kind of acts of genius, but that the survival and the resistance to these acts really is a kind of uh, genius. And also that there are ways in which um, the racial technologies um, have far surpassed their inventors in terms of the, the kind of um, kind of work that they do. So this is a quote from Wendy Chun, segregation as an important, is an important US racial technology. So I'm, I'm gonna address that now. This is a way of me kind of segueing in, of course, to the work that I've done in Detroit and infrastructure in addition to housing and, and why they come together. Um, but you know, one of the ways that we address this in terms of thinking urbanism is of course the kind of, you know, the obvious artifacts of racial segregation and mapping. And, and Wendy Chun kind of turns that inside out um, in, 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 as far as really looking at um, contemporary social media in relationship to these techniques of redlining and mapping, that part of what these maps do is they don't just draw boundaries around. And this, this is wonderful. This website um, has many, many cities in the US and all their historical red lines. They don't just draw boundaries that, that divide. They draw logics of the kind of field within, right? So that color yellow and that, co that color red, they start to mean something. And part of what Wendy Chun um, uh, sort of writes about is the way in which the networks that we exist in today online on our phones with all the thumbs up and thumbs down and the likes and all of that, which she calls a homophily, right, when that homophily term comes from um, studies in Massachusetts in the 1950s. But, but there, there's a way in which basically it just means you're supposed to like people that like the same stuff as you, right? And that's a really powerful uh, technology. And it's a technology that Wendy Chun traces back to these maps. Um, part of what I've been interested in in Detroit um, is the ways in which um, that registration of not just the homophily, but also the exploitation um, in terms of exploitation of resources and, and, and how infrastructure produces um, sort of amenities some places and then toxicities other places. Um, that that is something that, that occurs not just at the level of the ground, but beneath the ground. And, and Detroit becomes a logic of the water system as well. Um, and so, but, but without kind of getting into the weeds here, I don't want to, I'm going to show you the mapping that I've done about the water system and then kind of jump immediately into um, other studies of housing. But I, really what I want to highlight is the ways in which the delivery of water and the delivery of houses and basements are aligned and part of a, a larger system. But I want to also link that then to this kind of question of um, the racial technology. Uh, and, I, and I also, before I get into my own work, I want to link this back to that definition of design that Annie Albers gave us. So to return in this manner to the Negro, let us for the sake of experiment consider the Negro as not only a mode of technology, but more specifically a mode of design. To borrow the Bauhaus rubric as Annie Albers presents it, we can ask the following questions around this design technology. 
How does the Negro engender an immediate or implicit lucidity? And so these are all picking up on that quote that I read you, the implicit lucidity. What touches the Negro? What does the Negro render comprehensible and what is reduced to achieve this comprehension? What is the confusion that the Negro avoids and how does the Negro divert the bad ratings that confusion would provoke otherwise? What are the things shaped by the Negro and how does the Negro do work of clarification of controlled formulation on these things? To the extent that we can schematize a performance of the Negro along the lines of these questions, we will, according to Albers, have established the basis for the technology of the Negro to do design work in any field, quote, from city planning to the planning of a house or a road. So effectively, the, the Negro um, plans the water system of Detroit um, with the expansion to the suburbs in the 1960s. Um, and I guess, I, I guess I do want to hesitate on this, this drawing, which also is in this chapter. Um, because this is also a moment of, of Hilbersheimer, who was the, the kind of urban planner. And this is Chicago, but I just rotated it so that north is to the right, so that it could fit easier on the page. But that, that's the big Lake Michigan in Chicago right there. The greatest encounter between the Bauhaus and the Negro could probably be located in the erasure of huge swaths of North American cities. In this Hilbersheimer drawing, we find the means by which the Negro becomes an urban planning technology. This drawing implies a collaboration between the Bauhaus and the Negro, albeit one attenuated through time and radically distributed in authorship. The archival title of the drawing is Effective H-Bomb on the Size and Distribution of Cities. The drawing demarcates Blast Range, Freshwater Lake Area, and the territory of major cities as hatched areas. The potential of the gridded dots dominates the page, a maneuver of erasure or displacement hidden in plain sight. The matrix offers up a hyper-rationalization of Broadacre City. That's Frank Lloyd Wright, because you're not architecture folks. Its principles reduced through Bauhaus methods to the most minimal spatial assumptions, almost a geometric proof. Plain sight, plain sight, plain sight, P-L-A-N-E. The Midwest is plainly replotted, becoming not so distinct from a pattern on a loom. Um, of course, the implementation of this flat decentralization in actual urban space demanded extensive territory claims, imminent domain and slum clearance, demolition and displacement, urban renewal decimated neighborhoods across the country, landing on Negro neighborhoods rather than a regularly spaced grid. The Negro shapes, clarifies, controls the formulation of this slow motion firebombing called urban renewal, quote, from city planning to the planning of a house or a road. So then before I get to the techniques that I'm using to, un to unpack some of this, um, just to give precedent here, you know, of course, MIT Media Lab didn't begin with these kind of consumer objects. It began also with Urban 5, which was a way of staging, uh, kind of computing the city. Of course, computing the city, had th these, these blocks had no notion of kind of difference or, you know, the kind of, kind of homophily networks that would actually kind of charge the city. Um, so, so to kind of then jump then to, to how I stage this in Detroit, um, part of, part of um, what's at stake then is a much larger set of resources. Um, so the entire freshwater um, system in some ways is, is staged in this um, question of Detroit access to water. And the, and the kind of context of this, which I'm not showing you, is that when I arrived to Detroit in 2013, there were protests on the street um, because many residents had their water shut off because their water bills were so high. And in many, in many cases, their water bills were higher than the value of their homes. 